Lyon. Mid France since 2018, Lyon, Greater Lyon, has been France's second city after Paris. Overtaking, do you say, Marseille? Two and a half million population in Greater Lyon and half a million in city centre as such. For the most part, I know it's a sprawling mess of shopping warehouses like St. Priest area. So I went to have a closer look. And it's nice. In Roman times, Lyon was named after the Celtic god Lug, who represented oaths, truth and law, and craftsmanship of many different skills. It's now a centre for Interpol, as amongst other things, and historically has been a centre for silk weaving. In Roman times, Lug, Lyon, was the centre for the Three Gauls. Now, where the Three Gauls were, it was a bit difficult to describe because there seems to be four or five of them. But essentially it's France, and then there's Belgium and a bit of Germany, and then there's also a chunk of Spain. I don't think they'd included Britain and Ireland at this time. The Romans had just expanded out of Italy, and France, Provence area, was the first... Provence was the first province after the Alps, basically. And while Lyon isn't in Provence by any stretch of the imagination, it's been Burgundy most of the time, but not part of Burgundy now. It was towards the centre of Gaulish France and the furthest extremity of the Roman province of Provence. A river confluence and a good position for roads. Essentially a frontier fort, well situated for the inevitable conquest of the rest of Gaul. Lyon is about two-thirds to a half of the way down the hexagon of France, to the east, towards the east, on the Rhone River, at the confluence with the Saône River, which leads off to the Isère, the river that flows down from the Alps, where I've driven from along the parallel road. There's also a parallel road that drives south from Lyon to the coast, the Côte d'Azur, the Mediterranean. A drive which should take you about two and a half hours. And to the north, it's about four and a half hours to Paris. If you're tiring, Auxerre makes a very nice stop indeed, especially if you're fond of Chablis white wine. But a drive from Lyon to Paris takes you through the empty heart of agricultural France. All agriculture is highly mechanised. This is especially true if you avoid the Lyon Dijon Cote d'Or winemaking region. To the north, Macon, not so much, but to the south, just an hour south, just that bit more than a day trip perhaps, there's the Hermitage, Grey Perrier Tain, just north of Valence, slightly southwest of Lyon, there's the Pilate Mountains and Forests that lead you to St Etienne, which to me is a band, but lovely place. The Pilat Mountains and Forests, where you can get Hors Cadre, out of frame, relaxing and thinking outside the box. But we're exploring Old Town Lyon, the second city of France. The pretender to the throne is the second in line, and the brother of Louis, the Sun King of France, tended to be known as the Dauphine, the Dolphin. Lyon has its symbol as the Dolphin. The heir to the throne is known that because of a deal that was struck in the times of the Crusades, medieval Crusades. There was a feudal fiefdom nestled somewhere between Savoy and Provence. Had a dolphin on its coat of arms, they swim up the River Rhone from the Mediterranean. Perhaps romantically, they used to follow the Greek traders in their galleys. And there have been bronze sculptures found in the river near Vienne. Very attractive town. Easy day trip from Lyon. But though my fiefdom is dead and no more, the heir to the throne will always be named after me. And mine, a quantum of solace consolation. That bite out of the south of France coast is known as the Gulf of Lyon. It's just a way to find Marseille and the River Rhone as a route to the food capital of France. Provence and languedoc Roussillon, separating you from the Catalans of Iberia. That bite may go some way to suggest why the most sunlight hours you can get as far north is Monaco, microclimate, the bump after the bite. 
via Lyon, old Lyon is mainly a renaissance city, with some medieval parts to be found. You can wander and discover the traboules, the narrow passageways, an incontournable, not to be missed, at right angles to the zone. And as you walk down the main shopping streets, give you fascinating glimpses towards, buried glimpses towards the hill, that you really should climb to see the cathedral, especially for a romantic evening. The cathedral is like a wedding cake, basically, a very ornate icing wedding cake. And inside, modern mosaics. When I say modern, not Roman, more arts and crafts, period. Fin de siècle, I'd place them as. If you get the opportunity, venture in through one of those many big, huge old doors, double doors, and um, have a look around the courtyards inside. Buildings needed to both shade you and shelter you from the heat and from the cold and provide security in this transient confluence of rivers. While it's the f- ingredients, the food, the wine, the restaurants, the cafes, that you perhaps really want to come to Lyon for, I'm going to digress back to that tenuous link of the Dauphine, the air and the spare, and all that nonsense. Inheritance. The laws of the ancient regime. Get down and dirty. Before the revolution, were the basis of new France law, and especially Louisiana now. As a state, you're not allowed to disinherit your own children. Forced inheritance. I don't visit them really, but as you drive around France, you see meuble shops and you get immobilia versions of this throughout Europe. This is the movable things like furniture and the non movable things, the immovable things like property, house. Using a looser term of property, property first goes to a spouse, then to children, and then to their descendants, you would often think. In French law, but current French law, you Descendants then pay the most inheritance tax. Traditionally in France and most of Europe, I'd say. Catholic Europe, anyway. The son or the sons would inherit the property and the daughter or daughters would inherit the movable things inside the house. I know. I know which I'd prefer, you're thinking. There is a general non-French specific statistic that says that any inheritance will be lost within two generations. And while pessimistic, this is largely true for a large percentage of the population. Huge percentage of the population. Of course, a huge percentage of the population doesn't inherit anything. (laughs) Bourgeois capitalism reproduces and reinforces social class inequality on a national and international scale. On a personal level, life based on the formation of mutual admiration and a desire for the other to become strong and pure, the feelings of his or her life partner in their hearts can still result as a byproduct accumulation of some property through their own hard work and labours, so long as the acquisition of that property didn't involve hurting or depriving anyone else, which is rather difficult if you think about it. All investment hurts someone, doesn't it? Exploits, I should be included exploits in there. Difficult but allowable. This is the Marxist way of looking at things. And with inheritance tax, all governments are heading this way, you'll say, because it should really default to the state. Much the same as if you died intestate. I do find the Marxist view quite commendable and Christian, really. I have received a very strange letter through the post that's got nothing to do with me at all. Translations can be really flowery sometimes, especially when the French being reverential. In France, in, on all official forms, you put your family name first and your first name second. Through the post, I've received a letter for a woman. Her surname is the same as my mother's first name. I seen it's from the cemetery service and stamped all over the envelope even. I naturally thought that my mother had died and my brother hadn't bothered to tell me, which doesn't seem unlikely. A right of burial. Our records show that you are the registered owner of the right of burial in the above-mentioned grave. I am writing to advise you the period has now expired. Therefore, please let us know if you would like to renew. Now, I have to wonder, are they writing to a relative, a living relative, or are they writing to the dead person's last known address? 
For your information, the current cost of renewing the right of burial for an additional period of 25 years is £461, which can be paid by card over the phone or a cheque made payable to the council, the department, the prefecture, and with absolute efficiency and no further embellishments. If there is a memorial, it is advisable that you renew, as you are responsible for this. Once the period expires, the council cannot be obliged to contact relatives and can exercise the right to make safe any memorial that could pose a danger to the cemetery users. In some cases, this could mean removal. If you wish to renew, please complete the attached form. Now, the aforementioned got me thinking, but it does say only lawn-type headstones and vases are permitted on grave spaces. £500 for 25 years. I could build a mausoleum and live in it. Off-grid, with solar and lithium batteries. Super insulated, of course, because you don't want it to get too cold. You get a chill to your bones. My apologies, but this is a sort of a gallows humour. Pessimism is the realism. as a way of dealing with a type of stress. My mother is gravely ill with a, something similar to Parkinson's, which they won't diagnose or treat, partly because she recovered from cancer and partly for financial reasons in a home, depending what the home think of you. They can charge more or less to you personally, but um, we won't be getting any inheritance, put it that way. Sticking constantly, Wi Fi's gone all low fi My can't be asked for the bottle, all right? You're not from around here. French inheritance tax laws can be both complex and rigid. Is it possible to marry a dead person? Posthumous marriage in France is legal but must be approved by several civil servants and the family of the deceased. France is one of the few countries in which it is legal to marry a partner posthumously after they've passed. However, children inheriting France, uh, it's difficult for a partner to inherit and they won't inherit much. It's limited. If your parents are still with you, they won't get anything. The French government will try and grab all of your international assets for your children, a forced airship. Not those flying Zeppelin things. But your spouse can inherit the entire estate. If there's no children, it's father, mother, brother, sister. A common format for gifting property in France is for the donor to retain a life interest, a usufruit, in the property. Since the usufruit is a value attributed to it, the value is deducted from the gift to the children when they receive the remainder interest, the a deceased spouse can sort of expect a quarter. But in France, again, one of the few places where the notary, the solicitor, will need quite a lot of handwriting on the will. You can understand it's more difficult to fake. Yes, debts do pass on, but they're sort of limited to the amount of the estate Especially after Brexit, and even before, it is possible to end up being liable for double taxation. Children from a previous relationship is the main reason why you only get a quarter. But one of the most interesting things about French 
tax, really, rather than inheritance, is that every 15 years or so, there's like a rolling process that you can gift £100,000 to each of your children. So if you're a Jewish person living in France and you've got a big repopulating family, you can gift 10 times £100,000 every 15 years, if I'm being a bit ridiculous here, but you get what I mean. It's all the same if they're male or female children. But who's got 10 children and who's got a million pounds every 15 years? Being resident in France uh, changes things slightly to if you just croak it as a tourist. But because of Brexit, I'm going to pause it here because it's all going to turn to into a time of writing. Crash landed about a week ago. I had a slightly social interaction with the customs official as I was travelling over the channel. He was just changing. It was the switchover between two individuals. And I don't know if I felt the need to say, at least you don't have a float to cash up. It won't take that long. Float being a bit of a pun, I suppose, seeing as I'm going on a cross-channel ferry. But he was saying how all the customs officers have had to sell up their places in France that they've bought and move back to England. It's just part of their job description, basically. <laughs> didn't think much of it at the time, but the longer I drove around, it, I started to frown, actually. Inheritance is dry as bilio as a subject until it's not, but it is for because it's never going to happen. It's like talking about something that's someone else's rivalry. Perhaps the rake chooses their course because they don't want to be like their miser parent, but they inherit just the same. Now that stereotype isn't what feeds the one percent of the one percent for the one percent. I think I misquoted that. By the anyway, I think we're allowed to say the one percent rather than. Autocracy. Inequality of wealth well beyond the social advantage, social class, wealth distribution, cultural capital, linguistic styles, higher status social circles, and aesthetic preferences, nurture or child rearing practices that go to create the social hierarchy that favours what goes into making you friends with that other person, like friends, as in life choices even. <laughs> You famously don't have anything. But hey, they were in New York, so that economic mobility was always a possibility. Knowledge, skills and know-how. Education. Human capital. But as the 1% increases its stronghold, what we're not today calling a plutocracy, we have to be careful about talking about human capital. A signpost. A red flag. Zombie movies are a genre that have really taken hold. We are the zombies and the plutocracy that we're not talking about as a plutocracy today. We're calling them the 1% or what Noam Chomsky and President Carter called the quarter of the top 1% in terms of wealth. Huge chunks of the population, the employed and the 
unemployed and the unemployable start to look like slaves or the unenslavable, especially to those that grew up in substantial privilege. Wealth inequalities mean that your country may be comparable with Jordan or Bosnia. High mortality rates and inaffordable healthcare, disease, obesity, diabetes and hypertension. Marxist theory of labour value. And even the Russian Revolution allowed some exceptions where others weren't exploited. I will delve into all the different sociological and anthropological terms of heirs apparent and heirs presumptive and co But I'm trying to make this accessible and approachable. No, just before the dry gets even worse, we're going to be delving off into ancient Egypt and the source of Jewish inheritance laws. There's a link there, actually, with the lawyer doing it for the money professional. Nowadays, you can leave your money to whoever you like. Uh There's a name for that, but escrow extends it further, a further level of control. You're dead, but you're still controlling your descendants. You put conditions. So you only inherit if you have children. You only inherit if you're married. You know the type of thing, but you can squirrel that down to... If you say please, I'm sure. Only if you have full bepe circumcision for your children. Don't know. But that seems to be the modern way that is given the excluder. Or if it helps women be provided for more, because you can do as you please, and it's respected. But women are provided for equally in law. If the Jewish female bloodline behaves itself and turns a blind eye and produces enough heirs, one of theirs, one of their male descendants, may be the beneficiary of that family industry. Be that what it may, you may have flooded the flesh pots of Venice or furnished the Habsburg Empire with your own yids from Poland that you educated and added value. Or perhaps it was just a less tenuous Washington political posture. Or health monopoly. Or just a straightforward investment hedge fund. The firstborn is everything, and protecting the firstborn is everything. The firstborn gets twice as much as all the other sons put together. And if the oldest surviving son isn't the firstborn, they're not going to get that advantage. So there's no advantage to the second son bumping off the first son because they got that voice telling them to Abraham's voice perhaps Abraham's voice didn't want that family to have clear escrow so if there's ten children the firstborn son gets half of everything and the other nine the other half is divided between those nine which wouldn't amount to quite so much if it was my family anyway I have to ask, though, on the east coast of America, does the firstborn son get double portions of every meal? Are they the most obese of the lot? Perhaps you could leave your... No, don't leave any comments. No, from studying the scrolls, which I have, of course, honest. If there were no living sons and no descendants of any previous living sons, daughters inherit. Brothers inherit if there's no daughters, and sisters inherit if there's no sons. You can understand how there's going to be lots of spares in Poland for the um, Habsburg Portuguese Dutch to make the most of. And if you're a Jewish person in the Christian world, historically, you could still keep in contact with your Jewish brethren in the Arab world, where there was no contact otherwise. I don't know what the going rate might have been. One white woman slave for ten one Christian country Jewish girl for ten Arab country Jewish girls possibly for some context please see the Paris video anywho if a daughter inherits then it marries a man not from her paternal tribe her land will pass from the birth tribe's inheritance into her marriage tribes obviously to the man these are the tribes of Israel let's remember however If a daughter inherits land, she must marry someone within her father's tribe. Like the sons of their father's brothers. How you, uh, they, made them do that isn't too clear, but really poor education makes a mockery of choice. And honour killings would have never been very far away. I need to know whether ultra-Zionists still apply such ideals, whether the 
propagandized girls buy into it. The double portion for the firstborn son, though. What if they've... Well, perhaps it's young sperm and they haven't inherited bad traits. Perhaps the oldest is always going to be more traditional because they're older. The firstborn of a new family, that's a whole different ball game these days. But the temptation for subsequent sons to exploit the females must have been huge. And when so much more prevalent at the end of the 1800s, when such terms as anti-Semitism and that terminology that we're representing now as the 1% of the 1% of the 1% came into being, Arabs didn't really figure on the horizon any more than Jewish people did and the unfortunate poor of both were sort of patronised, whereas the wealthy were one of us. But this was the time of entomology and anthropometrics and how you could tell what a criminal did for a living by the way they looked and their head measurements. This turned into post-World War Aryan ideologies and the worst of what was to come. We don't have so many Jewish people in Europe anymore. The east coast of America has done so much to repopulate birth rates so ethnographically higher than, well, much the same as they might have always been in Poland, that perhaps fueled the sense of being threatened that all suffered as a result of. Much of that tribe's master tribe moved to Israel and they've kept that level of subordination. But in terms of inheritance, we've almost come full circle to back to the Roman system that got left behind with Christianity. Promogeniture. Romans used to adopt a lot. Um, children were often I mean, ungrateful and privileged beyond belief. Much the same as now, they might not be having children because of their indulgences. I don't want to go further on that one. So Romans used to adopt a lot. They had their slaves. Their favourite slave used to do so much for them and they're so pleased with them. They can have everything. So Roman law was much like escrow now, where you can leave anything to anyone, pretty much, with few social or judgmental constraints. Protestant medieval times particularly wanted to avoid subdivision of inherited property, but the laws and what actually happened were often quite different. They were a minority and wanted to survive, but their doctrine of hard work and trying not to exploit others didn't generate huge amounts of income anyway. The Quran for Islamic peoples greatly improved the rights of women in comparison to pre-Islamic Semitic inheritance laws. Women should be looked after, so a son would have twice as much inheritance as a daughter, but that's still much more. A business given to a son, the most able son, we're talking about inequality of inheritance here, most generally. A thriving multi-billion dollar industry, a business, yet the daughter is given a balance of the actual inheritance, amounting to far less than the value of the business that is given to the son. It's a bit like the son gets all the working capital and then the daughter gets the 10%. Taxes and government wealth confiscation and redistribution are growing in Britain after the Second World War in order to pay the Marshall Plan, the huge debt that American war profiteers of the east coast of America brought to Britain. The landed estates, the stately homes of the landed gentry, had to be taxed at 90%. And many, while it's the nation's cultural heritage, many just tore down their own homes rather than pay. And as architectural salvage, many Americans then bought the stones. Baby boomers are supposed to have had a substantial head start. Social and class stratification have followed from that lead. All the prejudices that existed at that time have been reinforced and on a smaller scale has turned into its own type of dynastic wealth. No, just like the Romans, people do still marry people that they have a hold over, that there aren't their equals, but people do tend to marry within their socio-economic circles. Hunter-gatherers, where might is right, didn't have the pastoral land to inherit. Primogeniture predominates, though ultimogeniture, the inheritance by the most loved, the youngest, isn't unheard of. 
particularly with the Greeks. They like their Olympics, and the youngest tend to do best at running races and things like that. And that was a way of choosing a partner. Succession of the youngest and the fittest. You can understand it, can't you? Saxon England, before the Normans invaded those proto-Vikings, was predominantly ultimogeniture. Borough English, English boroughs, as they was known, the youngest surviving male child, presumably. A lot of the older male childs had already <coughs> martyred themselves for papa in battles, maintaining the fiefdom or the throne. Soakmen of Danelaw in northeast England, something like escrow, really. It was where the more local law of sock and sack, that of local private justice, sort of overruled the national Norman justice. A true Viking thing. The authority of the reeve at the Hundred Court. Impinging on the royal. So Crumman weren't bonded tenants. Their property amounted to up to 50% of the countryside, but they weren't serfs, slaves, either. Anywho, if you're the heir of a dolphin, make sure you get it in writing. And not handwriting. No countries these days accept handwriting. And... A scrawled signature could be under duress, and everything might get turned upside down if you can afford a good legal professional, or otherwise. The law is for sale. Typed and witnessed, and paid registered. Even if you get sold all up and giving it out as cash, you're supposed to register it and have it taxed, but just not big sums. Liquidise your assets. Get the state to pay for your care by being wise about the small print that no one wants to worry themselves about. If you've got a relative living in your home, a child or a person over 65, you won't be paying for your nursing home care. Now, Napoleonic law is different. Oh, you'll have to wait till another time for that one.